There is a generally accepted statistic that says that about 70% of those who identify themselves as Catholic have little or nothing to do with the Catholic Church. 70% of the people who call themselves Catholic rarely, if ever, go to church. 70%, a large number of people. That means that there are 30% of the people who call themselves Catholic who do go to church. And if you attend Mass each weekend, you are part of that 30%. Here at St. John the 23rd Parish, there are, on average, 920 people attending Mass, worshiping each weekend. 30%. The total number say that they're connected to the parish. Do the math. That means that there's about 2,100 people who are not coming to church each weekend. They call themselves Catholic, but they don't come. 2,100. 2,100 people. What would we do if they did? Do those people, I wonder, have someone in their life who is committed to discipleship that they can trust? I wonder if those people might have a reason or an example that would make them curious about a relationship with Jesus? Do those people have the desire, in at least small amount of way, to to be open to consider the possibility that a relationship with Christ Jesus might make a difference in their lives? Of course, those are the three themes of the last three weeks of my message series for this Lent on deliberate discipleship. And I suspect to all three questions, the answer is no. No to a person they can trust. No to an example that would make them curious. No to any sense of openness. And that's a problem. But I think the root of the problem is with us, the 30%. How many of us see our faith, our personal relationship within the context of the church, not the building where you attend Mass on Sunday, but the community of believers. I don't think we see our faith in the context of the community. For most Catholics, I think, who attend Mass, who just happen to be a group of individuals who are in the same place at the same time, doing the same thing. Uh, An adult parishioner recently wrote this on Facebook. Now remember, this is an adult. I was very moved by my first Stations of the Cross tonight. It's hard to explain, but I was touched in a strange way by them. Thank you, St. John the 23rd Choir, and, and thank you, Father John. This adult had never been to Stations of the Cross in her entire life. And I know who this person is, and I chatted with her about it. And after we finished talking, it occurred to me that it was in the context of a praying community that this individual experienced this very personal and real relationship with Jesus. This Jesus who wants to have a relationship with each one of us. You see, the calling to deliberate discipleship is meant to create a spiritual environment, an attitude, a way of life that that recognizing, that, that openly talks about, that honors what we as Catholics believe, what brings us together as a community of believers, our sacraments, our liturgies. Jesus urges us as believers to build a community that fosters disciples, that makes disciples, that encourages the baptized to bear fruit, and is structured in such a way that all the baptized can be open to and receive God's gift of grace in its fullness. Deliberate disciples live grace-filled lives. And you know, as the human heart, as we become more and more open to Jesus Christ, it becomes increasingly impossible to remain neutral, to sit still, to do nothing. As we grow closer to discipleship, we cross into a new frontier from being open to change as a mere possibility to actually engaging in an active spiritual quest We cross into the threshold of spiritual seeking, and we can no longer sit still. In fact, this is the fourth step on the journey to deliberate disciple, this spiritual seeking, actively seeking Jesus. But before we can talk about 
this actively seeking Jesus, I want to take a little tangent here, a planned tangent, mind you. I'll be back on track in just a moment. But in the meantime, where have we been as a church? Where, what has happened to our church? And I take the clue from our first reading from the second book of Chronicles. That passage is rather disturbing, talking about the community multiplying infidelity on infidelity and God sending messenger time and time again who was rejected and then God allowing the community to basically destroy itself and be sent into captivity. And after all the destruction and the, of, of, of Jerusalem and the, the tearing down, the writer of Chronicles echoes the words of the prophet Jeremiah and says this, All this was to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah. Until the land has received its lost Sabbaths, during all the time it lies waste, it shall have rest, while 70 years are fulfilled. I read that and I got thinking, 70 years? Hmm, 70 years. What happened 70 years ago? What happened in 1945? Do you know? Well, that was the year that World War II ended. A great and horrible war. And even though our land was not directly touched by the destruction of war, we certainly were affected by it. The whole world was affected by that war. And much of the world was destroyed. Cities were laid waste. And during those years of rest, what has happened? I think it seems like the church has been slowly dying because we've been in, in a maintenance kind of mode, in that rest mode, as it were, meaning that we've been satisfied with what has always been. That's what people do who rest, just take it easy and not really do anything. Maintenance, you know. But that's just not working anymore. And it's not working for the 2,100 people of our parish who are not attending Mass each week. They're telling us that what we do here each Sunday just doesn't work. And it can no longer work. We must move out of this maintenance mode now into the disciple-making mode to the mission mode, because that's what the church is, mission. It's time to do as the chronicler says, to build anew. And I have to say that my idea of church has radically changed over the past year or so, but most especially in the last few months. I've come to the personal realization that what we do week after week is not all that the church is about. It's important, yes, no doubt, because our liturgy and the Eucharist is the source and summit of the life of the church. But we're missing something, something very important. What Jesus tells us in the gospel, commands us in the gospel, to go and seek out the lost. We are to build something that welcomes all people into this relationship that he wants to have with us. So I wonder... Have we, for the past 70 years, merely rested on our laurels, comfortable to the point that any change that takes place is unwelcome, that what we have experienced is something that we would rebel against? How sad it would be if that were the end. But it's not, because the rest of the message from Chronicles speaks of an outsider who the Lord has sent, a chosen one, to lead his people. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, All the kingdoms of the earth the Lord, the God of heaven, has given to me, and he has charged me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever, therefore, among you belongs to any part of his people, let him go up. And may his God be with him. The gospel, John reflects on this, I think. This wonderful passage. And at the end of the passage that we have today, he says this, But whoever lives the truth comes to the light so that his work may be clearly seen as done in God. 
I think spiritual seeking means that we move from being essentially passive, from sitting down and doing nothing, to actively seeking, to getting up and moving towards God, to what God is calling us to. We are to go up to Jerusalem. We are to come into the light. This step of seeking requires the certainty that a personal relationship with God is possible. Because isn't that what we are exploring? I liken it to marriage, you know. Before you were married, maybe you and your spouse set about dating with a purpose. Asking these very questions. Is this the one, is this the person I want to spend the rest of my life with? Is this the one I want to give my life to? Well, we are engaging in this step of the journey, these very questions, this urgent spiritual quest, seeking to know whether we can indeed commit our lives to Jesus Christ, to his church, as his disciples. And to that end, I might suggest you do these. Experiment with the corporal and spiritual works of mercy. You don't know what they are? And go back to the catechism and, and read about them. But briefly, that story in the Gospels where Jesus separates, talks about separating the sheep from the goats. Feed the hungry. Clothe the naked. Visit the imprisoned. Instruct the ignorant. Pray for the dead. Do those. And then explore the vast diversity of prayer within our Catholic tradition. And go back to the catechism again and read the section in there on prayer. It's beautiful. It's not difficult to read or understand. Our church has a wonderful tradition of prayer that's deep and rich and vast. And there's something that will touch everyone when it comes to prayer and our relationship and building that relationship with God. Begin to study the great wealth of, that is contained in all that the church teaches. Again, start with the catechism. Especially those things that you might not agree with, or you might say, I don't believe that. Why not go out and find what the church really teaches and, and how it understands those things that you don't agree with? You might find yourself changing your mind. You see, it's only when we do these kinds of things that we will be able to make the next step next week to deliberate discipleship.